Hi everyone, my name is Krista Jen Mascaro and I'll be presenting to you about apple snails in Hawaii. The species that I'll be mainly talking about will be Palmacea canaculata. They are part of the aquatic gastropod family known as Ampularidae. They are commonly known as the golden apple snail or the channeled apple snail, and they got its, their name because they are able to grow to be the size of an apple. Here in the picture, you can see that they have a yellowish to dark brown shell, and they also make very common aquatic pets. Here's a quick video of a snail in the tank. These snails live in tropical areas and in slow-moving freshwater that includes rice and taro fields, ponds, ditches, wetlands, or even slow-moving streams. These apple snails also have macrophotophagous habits in which they feed on plants and plant materials. These apple snails also have both gills and lungs, lungs that allow them to breathe in both water and dry air. These snails actually like to lay their eggs out of the water to help prevent them from being attacked from other aquatic species. They can live anywhere between 119 days to five years, but any exposure to high temperatures can lead to a shorter lifespan. Now, where do these snails come from, you may ask? Well, they're native to South America and several species in the Palmacia genus have been introduced and found in many parts of the world. That includes many Asian countries, North America, Europe, and the islands of the Pacific. The primary mode of spread of these snails was by those who saw them as a potential source of food. This is probably because these snails are high, are very high in protein. Here's a picture of the Filipino dish called ginata on kuo. All it is is apple snails served with some um, seasoning and co coconut milk. And another reason why they are introduced to many parts in the world is because a lot of people like, like to trade them due to their very appealing and attractive looks and because of their size. As we're getting into later, these snails have also become very invasive all over the world and have been considered a pest in almost every place that they're introduced to. The two most common invasive apple snail species are Palmacea caniculata and Palmacea maculata. Though the introduction and transportation of these snails were often by accident, these snails are known for their voracious appetites, their resistance to dry periods, and their ability to reproduce very quickly. All of these are factors to why they are pests or inconvenience to us agriculturally, environmentally, and to and are harmful to our health. These snails are also potential vectors of zoonotic diseases like rat mongrel, and they are also known to be a vector for intestinal and blood flukes. Here's another video of a snail and how much eggs they lay at a time. The Palmacia connectulata snails in Hawaii though were said to have come from the Philippines. The reason for that is because through many studies they found that the most common haplotype in the Philippines is also the same common haplotype that we have here in Hawaii. In Hawaii, this specific species is present on all islands except Molokai and Manai. Some areas in where infestations are extremely high are Hanalei Kauai, Kianai Maui, and Lapio Valley on the Big Island. The species Kila clinica is also have said to be seen on Molokai and was first seen on the Big Island in 1966. In Hawaii, kalo or taro is culturally and spiritually important, especially for the native Hawaiians. As many of us know, taro 
is sacred to the Hawaiian culture because it is said to be a connection to their ancestors. It is also known to be the source and root, root of life. Finding taro is very important in Hawaii. It's important education as well, as students, teachers, and community groups use our irrigated taro systems to explore topics scientifically, artistically, and medically. The introduction of these aqua snails threaten, threaten all of these aspects. Back in 2004, the farm value of taro was reported to be 2.7 million US dollars. But with the snails causing a result of 18 to 25% damage, it had dropped by just $5 million, by $5 million in just 2005. These apple snails damage the taro plants by chewing into the corn or the root of the taro plant, leaving a hole in which bacteria and other pathogens can enter in. They also eat the young taro shoots. Though all the resulting damage eventually kills the plant or drastically reduces the crop quality and yield. In the late 90s, 90s, Hawaii used copper sulfate as a pesticide to help control the aqua snails that were being serious pests for our wetland crops. They tested six soils from the great group order Tropopet, which also represented major wetland taro growing areas in Hawaii. They tested one from Hanalei, where, it's known, where they are known to grow taro, another from Kapa'a, known for growing rice, two from Pahaba, Oahu, one from Kilme, Maui, and the other from Waipio Valley on the Big Island. If we can assume that the average amount of copper that they added annually to the soil was 2.5 milligrams, or 5 pounds per acre, then the apple snow control method of using copper sulfate can be tolerated for at least 84 years in Honolulu soil and up to 200 years in the mountain soil before any copper biotoxicity became an issue, becomes an issue of concern. This also includes the recommendation in flooding the soil clean for at least 48 hours before planting the taro. Through this study though, they found out it didn't really solve the apple snow problem because in addition to causing potential toxicity to our crops, some other negative concerns with this method was that it lacked specificity, meaning that other aquatic organisms could have been at risk and become toxic. It also led to the possibility of sterilizing the land, which becomes a sensitive issue because the land in Hawaii is very sacred and holds significant significance to Hawaiian and ancestors as well. So what should we do, you may ask? Well, there are many things that we could do. The first thing being that we should take the approach of understanding the origin and distribution of apple snails for early detection and control these invasive snails, or at least we could slow the rate of new invasions. invasions. And by understanding their reproductive modes and life cycles, we can predict their spread and impact. We also should educate and encourage people not to eat raw or undercooked snails and to avoid eating any raw vegetables that may have these juvenile snails or eggs, especially in the regions where these snails are known to be present. In Hawaii, our wetlands receive very little invasive species managing. In just 1989 to 2004 alone, the control projects in Hawaii cost at least $400,000. It is evidently clear that economic and crop loss due to these apple snails are quite significant. And with control projects not being much of a priority for the state, we need to do what we can to help these wetland farms that we have in our state. According to the Statewide Strategic Control Plan for Palmasia Kamikulada in Hawaii, made by Pen11 and the group called Unipa'a Nahui Kalo, here are some common methods that are brought from them. The first one being we could change tarot growing methods in which we could use trenching or landing. Trenching is a basic practice that involves making a shallow ditch around the inside edge of each loi so that the water drains from each patch and the snails can eventually gravitate to where water remains in the trenches, making it easier for removal. 
Mounding is a traditional Hawaiian planting technique for planting kalo. We plant the kalo in a hill-like mound or in raised soil so that the water in the lo'i remains a lower level. The taro roots within the mound will then stay wet but the snails won't be able to attack the corn through the dirt. Another method is to set out baits for apple snails, leading them to gathering in a certain area, which makes collecting them very much easier. Lettuce, cassava leaves, sweet potato, taro, and pap papaya leaves are suggested. Or basically anything that would be more attractive than the crop being grown would work as bait. Using domestic ducks is also a low cost and easy to manage method for controlling apple snails. It is also proven to be the most efficient and effective at reducing snail populations and the amount of physical labor needed for taro farmers to maintain their crops. Farmers like to use a number of greens, but in like Pio Valley, the pecan green are most preferred. On Maui, they prefer to use the black Cayuga ducks. But regardless of either greens, any breed that ducks are not able or have little desire to fly is great because they won't damage the low into as much. Ducks are great because they tend to target the smaller cells, including the eggs, which then reduces the number of snails that we see reach maturity. And for the larger snails that the ducks aren't able to consume, we can resort to hand picking. With this method, we also don't have to worry about the ducks being lost to dogs, mongooses, and other predators, or even people coming in and stealing the ducks, or the ducks dying from old age. Hand picking is also the recommended practice for all countries right now. Daily and weekly removal of snails and eggs are required for this method. Farmers in Hanalei actually estimated as much as 200 pounds of snails per acre were pulled from the lo'i during the summer of 2006. Snails hand collected from lo'i are then typically dumped or, or placed at a composting location where they are crushed and or stomped on. They try not to leave large concentrations of dead snails near tire patches because it just ends up drawing in rats and other vermin. There is still lots of improvement that is needed for this method, especially because disturbance in the lo'i is supposed to be limit, very limited as possible to prevent damage to the roots of the plants. This method, though, is also very time consuming, consuming and lots of labor is needed. This photo is from when I had the opportunity to attend CTAR's Meaningful Experience Trip back in 2016 where some of our students got to visit the taro fields in Honolulu Valley. We used snail picking sticks to scrape off and remove the eggs off of the taro. But as you can see in the picture, we were only able to get the ones that were within reach because we weren't allowed to step in the patches for many reasons. Here's a short video. These are the little eggs that I picked off from the Tire plant. If anyone else is interested, just Google Haraguchi rice mill and then just read up and see what interests you. This rice mill is actually a sixth generation working taro farm in that the Haraguchi family has worked so hard to restore. This organization is a nonprofit and is guided by an unpaid board of directors. They have many educational programs and offer many ways that you can help support what they do. From guided tours to school tours, I'm sure you'd find one that fits you. Their tours also cover everything from planting to harvesting and even taste testing some of their produce. I'd personally recommend visiting this place if you ever find yourself in Kauai because there's so much to learn and it very well is the only historic rice mill left in the entire state of Hawaii. But if you're generally interested in restoring taro overall, there are groups like the Honipa'a Nahui Kalo, and they have been restoring lo'i around the state for at least 20 years. There's also the Ho'okua Aina group, and they are based in Kailua, and they offer various opportunities for you to get involved, from things like internships, mentoring programs, communities, or even if you just want to buy some kalo.
There are many ways to help restore our island's taro and wetland field. And it is our job as residents of Hawaii to do what we can to help preserve these fields across the islands and to protect them from the invasive Palmacia paniculata apusnel species. Here's some of my references and citations. And with that, thanks for watching. Bye.